Hello everybody, this is uh, Dr. Novak, and in this video I'm going to have some questions and some experiments that somebody did from a guy named Mark, and he has some questions he wants me to answer. Uh, these are real good questions, so I thought maybe everybody would like to uh, hear the answers to these and some of the experiments he did. The photograph you were looking at is from uh, Peck Tech. And this is a recent one from a show we went to in Chicago. And this was the Aqua Show or whatever in Chicago. They had one here in Florida recently, but this one was in August. And uh, he's doing a review or he's doing an interview with uh, Aquascapes. And, of course, the, all these 18 tanks were aquascaped by the Chicago uh, Plant Society. Now, there's two societies. There's a Plant Society, and then there's a Chicago Cichlid Association. And sometimes the Plant Society would come and sell their wares at the, uh, like the flea market that the Chicago Cichlid used to have. And believe me, that, that was a fun time. Whenever they would have their uh, flea market, the Chicago Cichlid Association, the good everybody was showing up to there to buy fish, really, tons of fish. Uh, the people from the Chicago uh, Plant Society would come sell real nice plants, but you can get fish at a real good price. These are all basically done by private breeders, um, and they would come and show their wares, and you can buy them at a great price. But anyhow, getting to this, the reason I did this, and I'm showing you this, here, here was these tanks. He said they all set them up and everything. But I thought this uh, comment that was made, which I'm showing you by Big J, was really spot on. It says the untold fact about all this aquascaping stuff you see at the show. It's not that hard to set up any of these tanks initially. I have to agree with them. I'm not an aquascape expert, but I, I get pictures of people's aquariums and aquascaping seems to be initially pretty easy to your taste. I even have a guy who, who aquascaped half the tank for his children and wife and the other half for him. Uh, as, as he says, it's keeping everything alive after six months without the plants turning brown and dying. That's the hard, impressive part. And I thought, that that's spot on. That is really spot on. Every one of these tanks, if you look at it, the substrate, sand, whatever, thrown right at the bottom of the aquarium. And now they put a bunch of plants in. Their aquascape is beautiful, but how long is it going to last before you have to tear the tank down, before it's a piece of garbage, you know? So I thought that was spot on. This is why so many people drop out of the aquarium hobby. They, they see something like this at a show. Oh, it's that easy. All I need to do is get a bag of sand. Boom, bada bing, bada boom. Put it at the bottom of the aquarium and put some plants in it. That's it. Wow. Easy piece of cake. And uh, no, just like this guy said, th th that's the easy part. The hard part is keeping everything alive within six months without cyanobacteria, beard algae, and everything else attacking your plants. Your plants are all turning brown. Now you're scrambling around trying to get all kinds of uh, uh, fertilizers and everything, thinking that's wrong. Then you wind up telling you, oh, well, you need a new light. That That's not going to work. Then that doesn't work right. And how are they doing it? Well, you know, at the store, they're not telling you 100% truth that, oh, we're changing our plants. <coughs> Or they only have a one or two fish in there, or they have a big, huge aquarium, you know, five-gallon aquarium with a betta in it. Yeah, a betta is really going to pollute aquarium. Anyhow, um, so I thought that was interesting. That's why I took a uh, screenshot of it to show you. Anyhow, in this video coming up, I'm going to be doing uh, some research that a guy did named Mark. He also came up with some questions about pH and using kitty litter and we'll get into that right after this. A 
A little update on my tank. Uh, it's Sunday morning, 6.63 pH, 356 for the millivolt reading of the ORP. Uh, it's pretty stable now. It's not really fluctuating anymore. I did a water change on Friday. It's Sunday morning, so the tank has settled down. But uh, 356 millivolt uh, for your oxidization uh, is real good. Okay, like I said before in my last video, that's saltwater tanks, not freshwater. But that's that's excellent. And uh, now I'm going to get into the video. But I thought I'd give you an update on that, just so you could see that the tank has settled down, and I'm trying to get the pH up. And there could be two reasons why. It could be you know. The substrate, we all know the fluval does dry pH down, so I'm trying to work around that with the, of course, uh, the baking soda, and of course, uh, uh, it could be a little bit because of the kitty litter that I'm using could be driving the pH a little down, but it seems to be going up slowly by adding the baking soda, so I'll keep an eye on it. Anyhow, let's get to the video about Mark's experiences. Okay, here it is. Uh, key questions left open after watching videos and reading book cover to cover may be helpful in generating future content ideas. Number one, impact of baked clay on pH. I love the paper written by the British contributor to your book because baked clay seems to be essential. I made an entire plenum out of it using 40 pounds to create five inch thick layer in my 20 gallon long aquarium. When trying to get all the bacteria grown, I was surprised to find my pH dropped from the normal of 8.0 from tap to below six on API test kit and likely to 4.5 using test strips. Photo of experimenting, uh, experiment, Experimental testing above, okay. I assume the needed bacteria cannot grow with pH this low, and the plants I aspire to have would also struggle with anything below 6.0. I believe you mentioned this in a sentence in your book around page 112 to 118 about compounds with high CEC dropping pH. My guess is that the koi pond keepers have so much water that many BCB baskets do not throw off their pH. Uh, just a little comment here. A lot of koi keepers do have trouble keeping their pH and therefore they use uh, shells to help stabilize and bring up their pH, even if they're not going to use an oxy filtration system. That's just a common problem with koi keepers, keeping their pH up high enough. And uh, so they will do other things of using shells or using baking soda to bring their pH back up again. But this is a common problem even without the anoxy filter. Okay, pH dropping to low levels in ponds. Okay, going on with what he's saying. However, aquarium keepers would easily approach a 1 to 4 ratio of baked clay to water ratio. If you were looking for content ideas, I might suggest the following. One, how baked clays impact pH in freshwater aquariums 5, 10, and 20 gallons. I think the answer is to add calcium carbonate via shells to the tank, but it would be interesting to hear your thoughts. Now, that is an idea. I've been hearing people um, say that their pH went down I have not been affected by it. When I did my 20 gallon, I made a BCB basket. I didn't really notice my pH drop. Anything to write home about. Okay. But um, calcium carbonate uh, via shells, that's a very common practice that pond owners do. Really, whether they're using cat litter or not, it's a very common practice of using shells to. Well, look at me, I, I'm struggling with pH because I have two points against me. One is, if I the BCB basket is a big basket, it's as big as a 2217 canister filter, and the next thing is, I have that substrate, which lowers the pH. It even says it lowers the pH. So, 
I have two strikes against me trying to bring my pH up, but it's it's manageable. You know, I'm doing it because I have a top off system. But yes, I've been hearing people <coughs> with small aquariums having a pH problem, and that would be something that calcium carbonate or something to ra raise your pH would be normal. Or using uh, calcium carbonate via shells or something like that. Now, shells do add calcium carbonate, but remember, they do a better job in salt water than they do fresh water of deteriorating and releasing that calcium carbonate, which I don't know if a lot of you freshwater hobbyists know or not, but salt helps disintegrate that calcium carbonate and add it back into the system. That's why you can have pH up. It's easier to, for me, it's easier to raise your pH than it is to lower your pH. But apparently, it seems easier to lower your pH. Now all you have to do is find something to stabilize that pH. Like my aquarium where I've added baking soda to the top off. And now it's 6.6 .6 or whatever, uh, 6.3. I'm going to try to get it up to 6.8. Uh, I talked to another fella, and he'd like to get his up to at least 6.8. Uh, and then it drops down when the CO2 comes on to like 6.49 or something like that. So it does, CO2 does drop the pH. So you have to remember that. If you're struggling with pH and have a low pH to begin with, and you're going to add CO2, it is going to even drop your pH a few more points lower. Something to think about if you're already struggling with pH. But then again, if you want good plant growth, you're going to have to want to add some CO2 to the aquarium. That's why a lot of people end up with problems when they try to get their CO2 and their drop trackers up to 30 parts per million. And I've had people say, well, that's what's recommended. Yeah, that's what's recommended. But that is not what's really needed. Okay, there's a difference between what is highly recommended or what is actually needed to do the job. And plants do not need 30 parts per million of CO2 in the aquarium. So if you do add CO2 and it at least raises the numbers higher than what the tank already would have, that's a great benefit. Let's say if you only had 3 parts per million CO2 and you only raised it to 7 or 8, that's still better than 3 parts per million to help your plants grow. They'll grow slower than at 30 parts per million. They may not pearl as much, but they still will be photosynthesizing. But you won't uh, have to worry about dropping your pH drastically because when I was in Illinois, our pH was 7.8. And just by adding CO2, I could bring that pH to any number you wanted, 6.5, 6.8, just by using CO2, pumping in a lot of CO2. So that's something to remember that if you are using CO2, you may want something to monitor your pH a little better than a drop checker. And now with pH monitors out there being so inexpensive, that would probably be the way to go. Like me, uh, my meter shows pH and redox. Why not show both? So it's just something, food for thought, instead of using a drop checker, because drop checkers take so long to actually turn colors for you, and you may be overdoing your CO2 when you don't have to. Okay, so that was the first thing he, he's, he recommended, which, which is true. If you are having a pH problem, you can add some baking soda or something <coughs> excuse me, to the aquarium to raise it. Okay, how much baked clay delivers optimum results? My guess is that 40 pounds is a 40-gallon aquarium was way more than needed. He's right. Man, he, he's right. He hit that right on a 40 pounds an aquarium that's 40 gallons. Yeah, it's not needed. That's why when I told you to build a plenum, you put a little bit of the baked clay down, a little bit of your uh, laterite. You don't need a more than a half inch of the kitty litter actually in there. Remember, it's only to track ions and stuff. You don't have to make the whole substrate out of clay. That's for a BCB basket where it's going to be contained. But, you know, a plenum, no, you don't have to make a whole plenum. That way you could use the substrates you like and just add the clay to there as an ion attractor. Get it? It's in there for an ion attractor. 
and so will the laterite act as an ion attractor. That's why in my tank, my 90 gallon, I didn't use any kidney litter, but I did use two full boxes of laterite, which does the same thing as kidney litter, but a lot of people are having trouble finding the laterite. Okay. Uh, going on, is there a reasonable rule of thumb for common aquarium sizes? This might help for followers avoid water chemistry problems with pH by not overdoing it. And for a small tank, like my 20 gallon, I made a BCB basket, a small one, as I showed in my videos, and that's good. Or you add a little bit to your plenum in your 20 gallon tank, no more than a quarter of an inch. I I really can't say what the weight of that would be. One pound, maybe, because you're only adding a little quarter of an inch. Let's, let's say you add a substrate, and then you add your kitty litter and your laterite, and then you go ahead with finish off with whatever substrate you want. Uh, it, it's, it doesn't need to be the whole thing with kitty litter. This kind of helps so you don't have that pH crash. And like his is 8.0, ours up in Illinois is 7.8. And here it's 7.5 in Florida. So we have hard water. So me, I got a double whammy with the substrate and the probably the BCB basket. I don't think it's a basket as much as it is that substrate because I have so much of it, several bags of it. I think I have four bags of that fluval in the 90 gallon. Okay, um, third, I noticed that my heavy wash baked clay did not drop pH as much as a less well washed sample. I did several controlled tests and found this repeatedly. I assume that the baked clay with more dust has more surface area and is able to absorb more minerals from the water, but it would be interesting to hear your thoughts. And that's absolutely true. Um, it's, it, I have noticed that, uh, which I showed on my videos, how I clean it out in the basket. But you know what? I, I don't get anal with it. It is what it is. It, it's going to have some residue gray coming out of it. Uh, another thing I found out that if you do make a BCB basket, uh, like me, I do it. If you're going to build a tank, let, let's say this is something I did with my 90. I made the basket ahead of time, cleaned it, made it. I don't get over anal with it, okay? You clean it, it's, it's clean enough, okay. He's, he's right there. Then I let the basket sit inside of the 2400 SDA aquarium uh, canister filter, and that probably sat in there, I'm going to say, for at least 30 plus days because I didn't have the tank yet. I had the filter but no tank yet. So I just put the basket in there. I loaded up the filter the way it was going to be before I used it, and I let it sit in there wet, and I closed up the canister. So there it was wet, sitting in the canister for over 30-some days. Um, I opened up the canister when I finally was going to use it, took a look at everything. There was no smell, no hydrogen sulfide, nothing. Okay, the basket was still damp, still wet. Put the top back on, put everything back, Bada bing, bada boom, hooked it up to the tank, filled it up, and that was the end of it. So sometimes it it, uh, it pays if you're thinking, I'm going to set up a tank, get your BCB basket, clean it, and maybe put it in a plastic bag or something for the meanwhile and let it sit. Believe it or not, there's bacteria that is going to grow from the water and everything. Not everything's been killed because now you're using it and the uh, chlorine is going to gas off and everything. And there is bacteria all over everything that it will start growing. So that's what I did. I'm just letting you know. You don't have to go get real anal with cleaning this because you'll never really get it clean because every time it seems like you clean it, it never gets 100% clean. The clay does it. Okay. Does the baked clay benefit from pre-charging with fertilizers before use as a substrate in a large fish tank to keep it from impacting water parameters? And yes, I think I mentioned that, that you could take the clay and when you set it up, you can get that liquid iron if you want. And you can, if you don't have laterite, and I've done this too, and I pour liquid iron 
into it. And the clay will absorb that liquid iron and then let the basket sit and absorb that liquid iron. Let it sit for a whole day, you know, and then put it in your aquarium. There's, there's not a problem with that. Some people can't get laterite, so we have to work around these things because that liquid iron is going to get absorbed into clay and will benefit the bacteria colonies. Okay, so it's kind of simple. If you can't find the laterite, take your clay, clean it if you have it in a basket or something, and then pour some liquid iron in it and, and let it absorb that iron. And then let's say 24 hours later, use it. So he's absolutely right. Uh, it seems uh, in vogue right now due to the benefit of baked clay and extremely low cost, especially for 100-gallon water or larger tanks. And that's absolutely true. But don't forget, you don't need all that much baked clay. You could build up a substrate. You pour some in there, maybe get a half inch, quarter of an inch or whatever of the clay if you've already uh, absorbed it with, uh, let's say, some iron, liquid iron, if you can't find the laterite, okay, don't don't get upset. Let it absorb that iron, and then lay that down, and then start putting your other substrates on top. What you want, pretty easy, no complications there. Okay. Can plenums and, and now number two, can plenums and BCBs be combined into one super plenum? Well, I have that. I have a BCB in my canister filter, and I have a plenum. Uh, you know, um, that's just the way I did it. So I can show you, my audience, exactly how I did it and how to make these products I'm talking about. I love your book and read every page. It seems geared towards koi pond keepers who deal with very large bodies of water where slow-moving plenums aren't typically used. And it, it's... It's geared for pond keepers, but you've got to remember, all ponds are is big aquariums. Basically, that's all they are because they have such big fish. So don't get lost when you read something that says pond. Just substitute the word pond for aquarium because basically that's all a pond is, is a big, huge aquarium of thousands of gallons. Uh, mine was only 1,200 gallons, and I know a lot of people out there have aquariums that are bigger than my pond was that had over 17 koi in it, and that was uh, 1,200 gallons. So just look at a pond. When If you do read it and say pond, just substitute it for aquarium. It applies to both equally. Not one is going to be better than the other, okay? The novice like me might benefit from some additional discussion on how BCBs and slow-moving plenums either deliver the same biological benefits or each offer something unique. And that's true. They, they both benefit, and they do offer because one is a solid mass of the kitty litter bringing in the ions, where the other one may have the plenum may not even use kitty litter at all. It just may use a uh, laterite. So the kitty litter is not an absolute with a plenum, but a BCB, yes, because you need something to bring in ions and to move fluids into the BCB, whereas the plenum itself, and I showed you with my 90-gallon, does not necessarily mean you have to absolutely use the kitty litter. You can leave it out if you want, but as you notice, I did add several boxes of the laterite, which is basically like the kitty litter and with a crystalline structure that will attract ions to it and also add iron to the substrate that you're using. And because I use the fluval, look at the, my setup. There was no kitty litter at all added to that plenum. So there's your differences between the slow-moving plenum and a BCB basket, how it's got to be made up. Although your YouTube videos show several setups, I was left with the impression that you never built a slow-moving plenum out of baked clay, which would seem like the most straightforward application of your book's principles. It would be interesting to know if this 
is a silly idea because of waste buildup or some other reason. Some additional questions novice like me have are, and making a full plenum out of kitty litter, it's not necessary. That's why I showed you that. People have acquired taste on the aquascaping which they want to present in their aquariums. We all do. So you have to work around the hobbyists. So if the hobbyist wants to use a particular substrate, um, ADA, uh, Fluvo, uh, wh whatever, Seachem, you have to work around what they want to do, not what you insist they do. So that's what my videos are trying to show you as the hobbyist. You don't have to make it out of solid kitty litter. You get the right kind of kitty litter. You clean some up. You put put it down or you put it down dry if you, if you don't even clean it. And you add your laterite if you can get that, your iron source if you can't. You soak the kitty litter in iron, then put it down, and then use your substrate. I have a lot of people that have used several layers of different substrates because this is what they want it. And that's what the good thing about a plenum is. It gives you, the hobbyist, a choice of what you want to use. And I'm not dictating to you, you have to only use this to be successful. I didn't. That's why I showed you my 90 gallon. I didn't. I used the fluval substrate with laterite. And then I put more fluval substrate on top of it. Like I said, I had like four bags of it in my 90 gallon. It cost me... I don't know, like 30 bucks a bag. So it wasn't cheap. But I did that to show you there's all kinds of ways to do it to be successful. And of course, I guess I am successful at a 356 millivolt reading. That's extremely successful. But uh, that's why I did it. I am not one of those YouTubers who say, you got to do it my way. No, I found out that people can't do it your way because I'm dealing with people all over the world. And you have to understand that. People can't get the resources that we have in the United States. Even the United Kingdom, you would think, oh, well, they should have no problem. No, they can't have all the resources we have. We seem to have an abundance of resources. We can get them real easy. So let's, let's work around what people can get and use. And that's why I showed you how I made my aquarium so you can mimic it and copy it and use a different resource that you have. Try to keep the grain size of your substrate though on the smaller size and not larger. The smaller the better. You know, like I said, one, three millimeters is good for grain size or your substrate size, I should say. Okay, um, here it is. It's the best setup for low maintenance and happy fish in a 20 gallon long. Slow moving plenum using airlift tube under five inches of rock gravel with iron core. A canister filter with baked clay filled with BCB inside. Well, that's exactly what I have, a BCB inside of my basket. Second, mechanical pre-filter sponge unit attached in front of the main canister filter. Well, I haven't had to do that because I have my filter loaded up like everybody fills their filter, you know, with a sponge, and then I have a filter floss or matting that you buy at Joann's. comes one inch thick, you just cut it to size, put that in there, the BCB goes on top of it, then I put some carbon, uh, use another filter, and then I'll put my carbon on top of that, and close up the canister. Pretty easy. So what he's kind of asking here is everything I basically have shown in my videos on one. Two, would one get similar results from slow-moving plenum made of baked clay with an iron core so there is no need for additional BCB in a canister filter? Well, that's a good question. If I had a choice, and I try to tell people that because this question has been asked, they say, should I make a BCB? Should I? And I always say, well, the first thing I would do is make a plenum because that is going to be where all your bacteria mainly is because you may have a hang on the back filter. So you're not going to be able to make a big BCB with a hang on the back filter. I don't know what size hang on the back filter you're going to be using. You're better off than I would say one, uno, make the plenum and do it right. That is where 
all your bacteria and everything. And that's where the magic's going to happen for you. Even if you put a small little hang on the back filter or, and that's what most people are going to use. So I would say the plenum, slow moving plenum is more important than a BCB basket. BCB basket can be made down the road. It is not a necessity that right now you have to make it. Because this, this question has been asked to me, which is more important? What should I make first? I would say the plenum. That is your more, get that right. And that's where all your bacteria, that way when you make a filter, whether it's canister or hang on the back, you can make it be mechanical. And don't worry about it making being biological. You can actually make it to be mechanical. All right? Uh, you just have to watch it that it doesn't reverse things that you were doing because a lot of people, the way to make these filters, are trying to make them into biological filters instead of making them into mechanical filters. Hang on the back is pretty easy, though, just to make it a mechanical with your carbon, if you're going to use carbon for your uh, aquarium. That's where you would put that. So it would be a mechanical and using your chemical filtration as far as carbon going to be to keep your water crystal clear and, and get uh, tannins out of it and everything else. Uh, whether you use dick boys or make your own like I show in my video. So that's what I would have to answer that with. Let's see. Two, hang on the back sponge filters for mechanical filter filtration as needed. Now, as I just said, you don't need hang on the back or cancer filters for biological filter anymore. Once you make a plenum and you have it at least three to four inches, you don't have to worry about that. This is old, old technology. Old technology, people. We always use in the past our under gravel filters with gravel on it was always your biological. So we always never had a problem because we had plenty of biological taking place and then you can decorate it up the way you want. And all we use the other hang on the backs and stuff for was basically to move water and to put carbon in and to do mechanical, pick up the any loose detritus or, or anything else that was floating in the tank and take it out of the system. That's all. We've, we've now moved away from that. And now we're trying to make, because of our shortcomings, we're trying to make biological in the canister we have this biological and like i said before if you have to have a canister filter and you clean it and you're so scared to clean it that you're going to kill the bacteria in it you got a problem with your aquarium a, 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 a you know a red light should go on and say hey wait a second what am i doing i'm so scared to clean my filter i got to clean it in tank water that's bull then you, your biological filter, you don't have enough biological filter. You're not using your aquarium. you got a big aquarium there. Use it. Make it a biological filter so you don't have to depend on your canister filter or your hang-on-the-back filter to do biological. Let it do what it's supposed to do, mechanical. That's what it was designed for. Now we've switched them over because we make aquariums so terrible, as I said in the very beginning of this video, where it's not the setting up of the tank. It's try to keep it going for the next six months without your plants dying, the thing getting all full of algae and everything, because we've lost our way over the years, and I'm just trying to get you back on path of, you have a big aquarium bottom there. you got a lot of substrate, has a lot of biological, and you have to remember, that biological is going to increase as the food stuff increases. So you have to remember that. You don't know how much your food stuff is going to increase with that with a plenum and you can watch it as you feed and stuff like this this is why in my tank i have over 80 fish uh, another guy in uh, new york has over 90 fish in his 75 gallon tank uh, this is not unusual using a plenum at all to have fish. So you don't have to be scared. You don't have to be saying, oh, I only want 15 little guppies in my tank because I am so scared that my tank is going to fail. You don't have to worry about that. Remember the science behind it. As food stuff increases, the bacteria increases 
proportionately to the food stuff that's being given to them. They have enough surface area. You provided it. If you make the plenum the way I told you, you have more than enough surface area for biological. So it, you don't have to now worry about your hang on the back or your canister filter being biological. They can be mechanical. The good thing of it is if you make a BCB to stick in your canister filter or a little bag or something to put in your, you can if you want. But sometimes uh, people do that and they haven't turned their tanks over yet to a slow-moving plenum. So these are just little things that uh, you have to remember. Even easier would be this setup, he says. Would we expect to return similar biological filtration to other setups? No. He's got a very good point there. If you have biological filtration, you set it up. Let's say you have an old sponge. Put it in the tank. Let it seed your tank. But it doesn't need to stay in there anymore. Once your tank is all cycled, you can get rid of it. You don't need added biological filtration, as I have said. That is only nitrate producers. Remember, any biological filter you make in your canister, any biological filter that you make on your uh, hang-on-the-back filter, sponge filters, they are only nitrate producers, not users. They are producers of nitrates. So that is going to add to your system the pollution to your system. It's going to lower your redox, and it's going to pollute your system. It's going, And those nitrates are going to keep building up because you have nitrate producers and not enough users. I think I've said that in the past. So eventually, if you want to cycle your tank and use an old filter, something like that, fine, perfectly fine. But after a while, when everything gets broken in, those filters can be now taken out and removed. Those biological filters are no longer needed. Okay. Uh, slow, mo uh, slow moving plenum using rocks, gravel, and iron core. Um, even easy would be this setup. Would we expect a return similar biological filtration to be the other setups? Slow moving plenum using rocks, gravel, and iron core to BCB placed inside the fish tank, sitting in a five inch tall filter bag with iron core. Hang on the back sponge filter for mechanical filtration as needed. Four, is using baked clay essential to the development of all types of bacteria needed for a complete nitrogen cycle? We already know, and I just explained to you, no, it is not. You can make a plenum without using the baked clay. The idea is, is to create anoxic conditions. And that is the whole trick. That is the game changer. Remember, anoxic conditions means that your substrate, if it's four inches, five inches thick, whatever you aquascaped it to, remember, you still have aerobic conditions. You don't have anaerobic conditions. Then you go into a reductive state as far as ORP. You still have aerobic conditions, but you hit that point where the oxygen levels drop down to 0.2 parts per million or less, but still maintaining at even 0.5 parts per million. You still have oxygen. That means you still have a oxidizing potential because you still have oxygen and therefore you will create anoxic conditions okay do you understand so what he says here is you will still build an anoxic filter. that's why it's called that's why i called it and named it an anoxic filtration system instead of just calling it a plenum because i found out that the plenum that uh, Chaubert came up with, which had no movement, I found out that if we went back to the 1960s and 50s and had a small bubbler moving very little water, it still kept everything moving a little better than a plenum without any movement at all. That's what I found through all my testing that it worked better than just a plenum. The plenum worked, but the slow-moving plenum seemed to work better. 
as I've explained in my videos. Could aquariums that utilize a slow-moving plenum with rock, gravel, and iron core create the right environment, or does the lack of baked clay uh, magnetic pool make this system highly unlikely to function properly over time due to waste buildup? And we already know the uh, answer to that is no. Look at my aquarium. I have a redox of 356, and I didn't use any baked clay except I just used laterite. Right there, your answer has been answered. I have anoxic conditions. You saw my nitrates are about five parts per million. My phosphates are what, 0 0.06 parts per million? You know, no. That question has already been answered. Okay, this is, uh, and then it says uh, barriers to full cycle development. I have started a 20 gallon long using your method twice and have been unsuccessful in developing a full nitrogen cycle after six weeks of each. Well, first of all, six weeks isn't very long. Noxy filters take a long time to really cycle. Unfortunately, I, I've, I've repeated that. I say that in my book. Don't expect nitrogen cycles to go very quickly. Sometimes uh, it takes longer than what people think and they become discouraged because they don't have the patience. As I have said before, patience will pay off. Six weeks may not be enough. I dose eight milliliters of ammonia daily and have gotten results 12 hours later down to zero ammonia and zero nitrites. But the nitrates always remain at 80 parts per million. I assume this means my anoxic bacteria are not yet flourishing. And he's absolutely right. Remember, you're using a bacteria that is a specialized bacteria that has to grow and it may take a little longer than those uh, bacteria that are autotrophic bacteria that have lots and lots of oxygen and will more than happy reduce ammonia to nitrites and nitrites into nitrates. So the only thing I can say here is patience pays off. Okay, in the end, you'll be a winner. Let's see, I'm a first-time fish keeper, so this is unexpected. However, uh, I may be making some mistakes that hold others back as well. One, can the bacteria that process nitrate work at the same rate as those that process ammonia and nitrite, assuming surface area is similar? Or should anoxic filtration users expect that the nitrate process requires much more time or much more surface area? No, it doesn't require more surface area, but it does require more time. And these nitrate users, okay, sometimes people make nitrate producers in their aquariums not knowing that they have to deal with what the fish is making, what you're feeding, which is adding nitrates every day, what the fish is making, their waste, adding nitrates every day. And now you have a filter on there that's producing nitrates every day. And now you're expecting miracles. So you have to give things time. The bacteria needs to grow. It needs time to grow and you have to be patient. There is no shortcuts to this. The only shortcut I have noticed that if you make a BCB basket and you set it up ahead of time, a month or two ahead of time, it may make a difference. But as far as um, your plenum, you can't set it up ahead of time. It is what it is. Once again, be patient. That's why sometimes I, I even say to people, use something like a, a Fritzine 7, it's been used a lot. It's been around for years and years. I don't recommend a lot of these products, but this product seems to help add bacteria, and it could help the, uh, what should I say, the acceleration of the specialized factutated bacteria that you need to grow. And don't forget, when you first set up that aquarium, there's a lot of things happening with that aquarium when you first set it up. We all know that. It takes time for an aquarium to break in. 
you know, when you ever set up a aquarium, you notice how you may get a lot of brown algae all over the glass. And after a while, after the aquarium breaks in, it doesn't matter whether you do a very large water change or not, the brown algae won't come back on your glass anymore. See, the aquarium's breaking in. There's nutrients and stuff in there that need to settle down and everything. So patience, once again. I place landscaping fabric between my under gravel filter plate and the gravel that sits on top. Could this fabric inhibit flow so much that the anoxic bacteria cannot function, eliminate the benefit of a plenum? No. That's slow moving, no, because you're constantly going to have diffusion or convection. If you're using a slow moving plenum and you are moving fluids out, fluids are still going to come through that fabric. That's what those fabrics are designed for, to have fluids go through them. So it's only stopping your sand or whatever from going through, but fluids, once you're going to displace fluids in the very bottom of your plenum, fluids are going to still move, whether from convection or diffusion, and that's what you're waiting to happen. Um, I think, now since I, I see these questions being asked, this would explain why people now are throwing their substrate at the bottom aquariums. They become too impatient today. Everybody's impatient. Everybody wants instant results right now. I want it right now. And this, I think, is our problem that we want instant gratification, and it's just not going to happen. As you see with my aquarium, in the end, over six months old, going on seven months now, in the end, you will be rewarded with very good high redox readings that, uh, like I said, saltwater aquariums want these kind of readings, and they've invested a lot more money in their aquarium than you have. So patience. Let's see, three. Uh, let's see, I place plastic caps at the bottom of the BCB in my Eheim canister filter to prevent water from rushing through it due to pump motor. Water can pass along the sides with the hope of magnetic attraction pulling waste in. Might, ha might I have incorrectly limited the basket's ability to attract waste? Unfortunately, he did. With this question, I see this all the time. I slow down my canister. Nope, 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 nope. You build a BCB basket, let that canister run as fast as it can run. The faster, the better. Do not slow down your canister. I'll repeat that. Don't slow down your filter. If you are making a BCB and you are putting it in your canister filter, faster is better. Um... I can't stress that enough because in my tank, I have that canister. It's pumping 475 gallons an hour with that Awaki pump. It's faster to better. Don't slow your pumps down, people. Let them go as fast as they can. In fact, if you can put another pump on there to have it pump faster, that would even be better. Slower is not better because... Here's why. You want to unify the tank water with your filter in the BCB basket so those ions get attracted in there constantly. Okay, you want to expose those ions to that basket as quickly as possible and keep moving it. It's a completely different train of thought than how Eheim does their filters, making them pump real slow through their canisters. On the other hand, we want just the opposite. We want canister filters that can really pump a lot of water through them. They work the best for a BCB basket. The more water you can pump through that canister, the better off you're going to be. That's, that's just the way I notice it works, then slower. Okay, so he is uh, incorrect in that. I have read that uh, dechlorinators with additional chemicals may inhibit the development of anoxic bacteria. True. You have to uh, uh, dechlorinators because they have other things added into them. We also know for a fact, now I've showed you, it will drop your redox. So your tank then will not have oxidizers. You keep adding these chemicals in, you're losing your oxidizers. You see, no one tells you that. So you keep adding all this junk into your aquarium, then your oxidation potential goes down. 
You want your oxidation potential to be as high as possible so you can have these oxidizers that will take care of the fish waste and the and the ammonia and the and the nitrites and the nitrates. You need these oxidizers. You put chemicals in and you lessen those oxidizers, as I have shown you in my aquarium using a redox meter. See, this should be explained to hobbyists, but why isn't it being explained to you? So all these dechlorinators and additives, they just do more harm than good because you are lessening the redox of your aquarium and lessening the amount of oxidizers that could be used to break down everything the way it's supposed to be. I have been using Seachem Prime, Seachem uh, Amgard, because they seem to be the two with the least number of additive chemicals. Remember, I always say biological and chemical insults. You hear me say that a lot on my videos. Biological and chemical insults. I've said that repetitively on my videos, and I say that for a reason. This is the reason why. However, each has an additional treatment for ammonia. Now, that treatment for ammonia just locks the ammonia and hides it away for another day, and it breaks the ammonia away later on down the road. It doesn't get rid of the ammonia. It just locks and binds the ammonia. So when you do a test kit, oh, I got no ammonia. But it's giving you a false reading is all it's doing. It's tricking your test kit because they use the same thing for when they do a koi show. They put this in the koi ponds to lock the ammonia so it doesn't burn the koi's gills when they're sitting in the vats to be judged. And it locks it away. So now you can do a test kit and say, see, I have no ammonia, so it's not going to burn my fish's gill. So that's what these do. These are chemical insults. In the meantime, they're lowering your redox, which is the ability then to take nitrites, as I explained, and add that molecule on it for nitrates. It's, you're lessening that ability. So uh, I don't know why this isn't being told to people. Let's see. Let's see. I have just started using the sodium thiol sulfate you recommended on your blog and videos. Basically, that chemical has been used forever. Forever. I mean, ever since I was a child, four years old, you, this is, this is what they use, the main thing for chlorine or chloramine to break away the uh, ammonia molecule from the chlorine. Um, it works. It does the job. It doesn't have a bunch of chemicals. All it is is one chemical. You're not putting all kinds of garbage into your aquarium that you really just don't need. Let's see. Do we know for other anoxy filtration users have had success using any of the commercial available dechlorinators? And... And then he ends it with, uh, thanks again for all your amazing work, Mark. Okay, so it would be interesting to know how people, if they are using different kind of chlorinators, how um, these dechlorinators are working. I don't recommend it. I recommend using the still tried and true recommendation that I have recommended to you and leave all those other chemicals out. I have a video on how to make dechlorinating uh, your own dechlorination by buying some. Uh, I think I give sites where you can even buy it. Uh, sodium thiol sulfate. One chemical. It works. Uh, it would be interesting if people can tell me how it did with the anoxy filtration because remember the more chemicals you add to your aquarium the more you drop your redox it's that simple these are insults that need to be dealt with chemical and biological that's why i've always said that to you chemical and biological try to keep the chemical part down as low as you can it will affect your biological chemicals will. Because if you don't have enough oxidizers, 
then you are not going to be able to break down what's in your aquarium and therefore you will have maybe a byproduct of nitrites or nitrates because you are actually lowering your oxidization of your aquarium and failing. As I started out this whole thing with what the man said, the untold fact all about all this aquascaping stuff you see at the show, it's not that hard to set up any of these tanks initially. It's keeping everything alive after six months without the plants turning brown and dying. That's the hard, impressive part. That's the part that people seem to have problems with, and that's the part we're trying to solve here to get you as the hobbyist to understand these chemical insults, biological insults that come into your aquarium, loses your redox potential, loses your oxidization potential, and therefore, boom, six months your tank is no good because you did something you thought was right because somebody told you, add this, add this, add this, add this, when you didn't know what you were doing and you lowered your oxidization potential of that aquarium to the point where everything starts dying or you come up with all kinds of algae problems. Okay, sorry for this being so long, but I thought that uh, little Q&A from Mark was great. He sent that to me. I thought that you would be interested. Uh, it went on a little long, almost an hour now. Sorry about that, but I thought this was interesting. I should answer these questions because they're good questions. And until next time, this is Dr. Novak. Uh, happy fish keeping.